All right, so let's get started. Welcome to the non commutative Geometry Seminar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Sergei Nechev uh, from Oslo to talk about crystallization of C star algebras. Thank you. So I will talk about uh, joint work in progress with uh, Marcel Wacker and Makote Mashita. So let me first give uh, some basic definition just to sort of get done with it, and then I will try to explain what this is all about. <clears throat> so we'll deal with the uh, equilibrium states. So recall what it means. So if we have a sister algebra, and we have one parameter group of automorphisms, and we have a state on A, then uh, we have KMS states that involve the Dishab beta. So these are states that define this identity for all sigma analytic elements in and then there is a kind of similar notion to this when p is equal to zero, or in other words, when beta is equal to plus infinity. So these are called so-called ground states. So these are states such that um, the function defined in the upper half plane like this is, is bounded. And then by usual fragment in the Lyoff principle, it, it's in fact bounded by product of the norms of uh, uh, these elements A and beta. So in particular, if you have KMS states uh, at finite betas, and then you have a limit of them for beta goes to infinity, you get a ground state. But in general, there are more ground states than uh, the ones which are obtained from KMS beta states. OK, so uh, the basic example, which uh, one has to keep in mind for a large part of this talk is, is the following. So consider the Toplitz algebra on uh, just the usual Toplitz algebra generated by uh, one isometry, the shift to the right operator. And we consider the scale gauge action on this sister algebra. So just rescaling the generator U. And then it's uh, quite easy to, to check. So it's kind of an exercise. So the example is not even simple, but maybe almost primitive. That for every um, beta larger than zero, there is a unique camera uh, state so-called Gibbs state. So it's explicitly given as a trace uh, with some density matrix uh, with the Hamiltonian defined uh, like this. And when beta goes to infinity, it converges to ground state, simply this uh, state defined by the sort of vacuum vector delta zero. And this is a unique uh, state in this system. We also, of course, know very well that uh, the Toplitz algebra is KK equivalent to complex numbers. So what we see from this example, so somehow uh, everything uh, KMS states for beta larger than zero, as well as K theory is described by just one sister algebra, just complex numbers. And the question is, uh, is there anything to this example? Yeah. Is it coincidence or there is something, something more interesting happening? And of course, if you look at this example isolated, uh, it's easy to dismiss it, but the point is that uh, over years, there have been a lot of examples of similar nature, of slightly different nature, where one sees similar patterns that somehow um, you have one sister algebra describing ground states of the system, and this sister algebra is responsible for uh, equilibrium states for large beta, and also somehow responsible for the k theory of the sister algebra. I, I give some examples, sort of more interesting examples later, but not many, just because of time restrictions. But the question is, yeah, so can we, is there something behind this? So can we explain this? And uh, there was a discussion some years ago, in particular during the Abel Symposium, I think in 2015, where Alan Pond sort of formulated it in a bit more, maybe precise form, but still somewhat vague, I guess. So the question is the following is you have a sort of thermodynamical system. So you have a sister algebra with a time involution. Can you somehow cool down the system, sort of freeze the system? to get something simpler. And this simple system algebra maybe uh, still reflects some interesting properties of the original system. Okay. And uh, this is a question which we try to answer. And I, I can sort of immediately say that the situation for uh, KMS states is, 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 I think, quite nice. But for K theory, it's uh, really somewhat murky. But uh, I will explain. So but don't expect much about K theory. Um, yeah, uh, let me just mention that uh, similar ideas, they, they have appeared in, 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 in different uh, related areas. Probably the most uh, famous uh, successful example is the theory of crystal basis in representation theory. 
So, uh, so the, the goal was to construct some very nice uh, basis of the reducible representation of this in the semi-simple algebra in which uh, the action by gener Chevalier generators have particularly nice form. And this is achieved exactly from this idea of crystallization. So one passes from a semi-simple Lie algebra, one passes to its Q, Q deformation, this Greenfield gene by Q deformation, where um, Q, the deformation parameter is e to the power minus page. So this page should be thought as uh, something like this uh, inverse temperature. And then uh, you let uh, Q equal to zero. So in other words, H equals to infinity. And what you get is uh, much simple algebras and much simple combinatorics. And you study this combinatorics, and out of this, you can actually construct and pull back this combinatorial structure to arbitrary Q, in particular to Q equal one, and construct this nice uh, basis. Oops, yeah, should be, of course, in a simple, nice basis in um, uh, modules or in G modules. Uh, similar kind of idea, but on the dual side was also used uh, in operator algebras, so in particular in the work of uh, Holm and, and Shimansky. Uh, so they, they realized that a number of uh, these Q-deform function algebras as graph algebras. And uh, the way sort of to find the graph is to, uh, to really pass to Q equals zero, where the relations in the algebra become particularly simple. So this uh, function algebras are no longer uh, Q deformations, but they have a much nicer simpler form. And from this, you really can recover the graph structure, but then you prove that the same graph describes actually all this uh, Q deformed spaces for Q not equal to one. And uh, there also work uh, by Alan Kohn with Kansani uh, and Marcoli on this thermodynamics of random motifs. And they even had uh, so-called cooling down morphism there. And I, I will not say really anything about it, but the idea was, was exactly like this, that you study a particular class of systems and you study their equilibrium states, and then you try to extract some interesting particular homological arithmetic information from the structure of uh, KMS beta states for a large beta. Okay, okay so, um, so let me uh, now come to the, the construction. And the construction is, uh, and the setup is, is, is very simple. So uh, we'll, we'll deal with not arbitrary time evolutions, but to kind of simplify matters, we'll deal only with Alma's periodic dynamics. So in other words, uh, we consider the spectral subspaces of the dynamics. And the assumption is that this uh, star subalgebra spanned by all this uh, sub spectral subspaces is dense in the entire space. Yeah. Of course, sort of from physical perspective, this is, this is a huge uh, kind of restriction, but uh, in fact, from if one looks in the mathematical literature who, who studied this uh, kind of dynamics, then this actually covers most examples. It's very seldom when people, people start studying something more general. So in this respect, it's not, not a big restriction. Okay, and then we, we do the following. Uh, so we consider the fixed point algebra, A0. You know, and for, for every lambda, uh, we uh, have uh, this two-sided ideal and this algebra uh, spanned by these elements of the form A, A star for A and A lambda. So we consider all these ideals for lambda larger than zero. Sum up all of them, we get uh, some ideal in A zero, and then we pass to the quotient. So we focus and denote it AC and call the crystal of our sister algebra A, or more precisely, the crystal of uh, the system, so it of course depends on the on the time evolution. Okay. Sergey, sorry, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Is uh, I lambda star the same as I minus lambda? Sorry. Is is I lambda star equal to I no, no, minus no. lambda? No, 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 no. Of course, of no. Course. That that's uh, and that, that's quite going to be kind of important later. These are quite different. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, in particular, uh, in many examples, one sees that uh, for negative lambda, uh, mm -hmm. uh, this high lambda is the entire system algebra. While for positive ones, you really have a, a sub uh, proper set, a proper ideal. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so, thanks. Uh, they, they are not easily related. Yeah. Okay, so we call, uh, we introduce the system algebra and uh, call the crystal of our system algebra of, of, of our system. Okay, so uh, what is good about the sister algebra? Uh, first of all, it indeed describes a ground state. And this is 
kind of very easy to understand if you just look at the definition. Um, so more precisely, how, how it goes. Um, so we consider this uh, spectral subspaces. So we look at all spectral subspaces which are non-zero, and what we denote by gamma the additive uh, subgroup of the real line generated by all these numbers. And we view gamma as a discrete group. So if you, if you take uh, then um, it's dual, then the action, uh, this is what almost periodicity means, right? that the action of our uh, real line actually extends to the action of this dual compact group. And as a result, we have conditional expectation from the entire system algebra on the fixed point algebra simply by averaging our, our own compact group. Or more explicitly, this is just uh, the conditional expectation which kills all the spectral subspaces are, uh, apart from the one corresponding to zero. And out of this, we will then get a contracted, completely positive map from our sister algebra onto our crystal, which is simply composition of uh, uh, this conditional expectation plus the quotient map you know, into our, this AC. And then I said the <clears throat> result, which sort of really falls quite quickly from definition, is that uh, uh, this way we have we get a correspondence between ground states and uh, states on AC. So, more so if more precisely, if this crystal is not equal to zero, then by taking any state on on this uh, sister algebra and composing it with this completely positive map, we get the ground states on our original algebra, and this way we really get a one-to-one -one correspondence between ground states and um, on A and uh, the arbitrary states on, on AC. And if this sister algebra happened to be zero, which can of course easily happen but, uh, if you deal with uh, actions which are uh, saturated, what is called, so all this ideal I lambda actually assumed to be the, the entire sister algebra, then a zero, then, um, then there, there are no sigma ground states. Okay. Sergey, just a, a, a stupid question. I mean, is that the same as a kind of a limit of the cooling for beta tending to infinity? In a way, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we want to think about this way, but as I was explained, there are kind of some problems of yeah, no, no, but what exactly to think. But, but yeah, the idea yeah. is that yeah, yeah. that if we were cool down, the system is really like right. This uh, this is what is left of uh, after freezing. Yeah, that's why we call it so that all this a lambda is somehow responsible for equilibrium states for. Uh, for, for finite betas, and when you cool down, the, all the things that have disappeared, and the only thing which is left is this very small system. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this uh, sort of shows that this is uh, from the point of view of ground states, it's the right system algebra, and then the question is, uh, is it good for anything? Like, uh, what what information about our original system algebra does it contain? So in order to uh, answer this, uh, we need to introduce some, some notation and, and sort of develop a little bit of theory. So the first thing is that uh, uh, we want to define something like a Fock model in this, in this generality. So we don't need any particular assumption about the system. So more precisely how it goes. Um, so for, uh, for every lambda in gamma and R, we can view the spectral subspace as a right sister Hilbert module or a fixed point algebra with this standard uh, inner product. Okay. And then uh, uh, we consider smaller uh, Hilbert modules or, or, or our crystals, which are just the factors of these spectral spaces by uh, these submodules, or you can equivalently describe them as this uh, tensor product. And by definition, uh, we immediately have that uh, the, the zero module, this x0 is exactly our crystal, AC, while all these x lambdas for lambda less than zero will be zero. Okay. And we denote by, by gamma zero uh, the submanoid generated by all these lambdas such that x lambda is not equal to zero. And uh, as we will see, at least in some example, in, in general, this is a much smaller sub, sub, uh, submanoid than just the monoid of uh, positive elements in gamma. So, so of course, all, all these elements are positive, but uh, in general, in gamma, there are many other positive elements which are not here. Okay, and then, sorry, oops. Um, better not to click, touch the mouse. Uh, so the right uh, sister Hilbert module, which is direct sum of all these X uh, lambdas, 
is what we call the fork modular. Uh, alternatively, we can say is that you simply take the direct sum of all this uh, uh, modulus A lambda over A0 and then tensor with, with this sort of crystal. So the, the advantage of, of uh, this picture is that in this picture, it becomes immediately obvious that the left action of A on itself, it still uh, extends to an action on this fork module. Okay. So this, this way we get a representation, which we call uh, this capital lambda, from our original sister algebra onto the, uh, this sort of fork space. Okay. So if you have uh, this fork module, you can uh, develop some kind of representation theory and the composition of states related to this module. You are heading towards the KK class, I presume. Hmm? You are you are like con constructing a, a C star by module, yeah. The yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I will come to KK classes. Unfortunately, yeah. We we'll let me come to this <laughs> later. Okay, so uh, we have this fork module, and uh, as I said, one can then develop some sort of general theory around this, and uh, in particular in. Recently, with uh, Zara Afsar and Nadia Larson, we did it for some particular class of systems, this uh, product type, uh, this uh, product systems of modules of uh, so particular semi groups. But uh, here, the realization is that, in fact, you don't, you don't re really need anything. You kind of, if you have this definition, you can just, just develop something similar without any particular assumption. So, what I mean by this, uh, um, uh, first of all, we have uh, we can introduce the notion of vacuum representation. So uh, let me call a representation of our original system algebra vacuum representation is uh, if it is generated by the subspace of vacuum vectors. And by this, I mean all vectors in the Hilbert space which are killed by these elements uh, phi a star for all a in, in spectral subspaces corresponding to lambda larger than zero. And um, yeah, and then uh, it's not difficult to prove them that, that uh, these are exactly the representations which you uh, which we obtain uh, by inducing the representation of our crystal by the fork module. Okay. So more precisely, uh, uh, the claim is that uh, we have a representation is a vacuum representation if and only if it is uh, induced from a representation of this crystal by the fork module. And moreover, uh, this way uh, to get a, a, an equivalence of categories between the category of uh, vacuum representation of our original sister algebra and the update representation of, uh, uh, of the crystal. Okay. So um, let me mention uh, one uh, consequence of this. It's, uh, it sort of gives you a, a slightly different way of looking at this crystal and, and how to compute it in, in practice. So from more precisely, from this equivalence, we can then immediately compute that uh, this crystal or the, is non-zero exactly when you have a, a vacuum representation. Yeah? So, so we have that uh, AC is equal to zero, if and only if uh, there are no non-zero vacuum representation. Yeah? On the other hand, it says uh, exactly complex numbers if you have a unique up to equivalence non-zero representation with a cyclic vacuum back. And it is uh, compact operators on a Hilbert space, even only if it has a unique up to equivalence irreducible vacuum representation. Okay. Well, as I said, this basically gives you a kind of different way of, uh, slightly different way of how you can try to compute this in practice. And just a quick example. So you can use something which was already done in, in the mathematical, mathematical physics literature uh, to, to compute things. So here is. Uh, a uh, simple example, so consider the algebra of canonical anti-commutation relations on some Hilbert space. So recall this uh, uh, algebra uh, such that we have generators uh, for, every, for every element in the Hilbert space. And uh, the dependence of these generations, generators is linear on, on XI. And we have anti-commutation relations. So the, uh, the different generators anti-commute, but if you take the adjoins of generators, then you have this kind of relation. Yeah. And, uh, and we have a gauge action when we simply rescale the, generator, um, the generators by, uh, by an element of the circle. Okay. Then if you 
look at this expression, uh, this immediately implies that the crystal of the sister algebra is either zero complex numbers. Because remember that of, uh, everything, every time you have an element uh, in uh, A lambda for lambda equals zero on sort of on the left, this will go into the idea which, uh, which, which goes to zero in the quotient, in the crystal quotient. Uh, and here we, we always see that we can always sort of map uh, at the expense of adding maybe constants, we can always move these elements to uh, these elements to, to the right. Yeah. So this, this relation kind of immediately implies that uh, uh, the crystal at maximum is just complex numbers. It could be zero. I, I guess, Sergei, you, you could also put a Dirac C if you wanted in this, in this thing. Namely, polarization of the Hilbert space. I mean, of the uh, original. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, there, there I, I will mention just possible. But, uh, yeah, this is kind of maybe the simplest yeah. example. So uh, yeah, so from this we see that uh, it's uh, either complex numbers or, or zero. But then we know that uh, uh, the non-triviality of the crystal is exactly the existence of, of a vacuum representation and for canonical commutation and anti-commutation relations, of course, we know that there is a, a vacuum representation. It's exactly the representation of the standard fermionic space by creation and inhalation operators. So the conclusion is that uh, the crystal is actually C and uh, this fork module is the usual fermionic fork space. So, should be. Okay, but I mean, this is, this is a simple example. And of course, you, you, you don't have to go through sort of force space to understand it because the, the sister algebra itself is quite simple. We, we know we understand it very well. But there are related examples uh, uh, which were started exactly from the point of view Fox spaces. And then you can just apply similar results to conclude something what the crystal is. So in particular, um, Bajerika and Speicher, uh, they started some sort of Q deformations of these relations. Um, so then we have studied the relations in a very general form. So the relations of this type, but when you simply require that you can sort of commute A and A star through, but uh, the expressions, you get some constant plus some expressions of this form that may be sums. And for those algebras, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, I mean, in general, it's not even known when these algebras are non-zero, when they have uh, fork type representation and so on. And, but they prove that uh, for some cases you actually have a folk representation, and then you can just apply this result and conclude for all the sister algebras they consider the crystal with uh, complex numbers. Okay. Um, yeah, so this just a comment that you can use some, some known results to compute crystals quite clear, but, uh, quickly, but I will uh, say a bit more how to compute these things later. So um, uh, out of this, uh, the, theory of uh, induced representation, uh, we'll also get a decomposition of, of, of states. So, so more precisely, if you have a representation, of course you have a largest uh, uh, sub-representation uh, generated by vacuum, vacuum vectors. And this, this representation, uh, you can apply this decomposition to states, and this way you can divide the states into two parts. So uh, let us introduce the following. Um, two classes, uh, the following uh, notion. So we'll say that a positive linear function on A is, uh, is of finite type if the corresponding genus representation is a vacuum representation. Okay. So I, I do not require the, the, the cyclic vector to be a vacuum vector. This is not the requirement. The requirement is that there is some other vacuum vector, which is uh, uh, then uh, generate. Uh, uh, Sergey, just, yeah. just a question to, to be sure that I understand. When, when you consider, for instance, the BC system and a, a phi beta KMS state for beta bigger than one, I suppose it is of finite type then? Yeah? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. This, this, okay. uh, I, will, I will get to okay. this. Uh, although okay. I will... Because it's equivalent to a representation yeah. which is coming from the vacuum yes. vector. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And we say that it is of infinite type if the corresponding genetic representation has no zero vacuum vectors whatsoever. And then uh, uh, this can be stated as some sort of continuity statements. So it's not difficult to show that uh, a state is of finite type, if and only if it, it factors through uh, operators on the Fock module. And uh, so factors in the sense that it is a strictly continuous positive linear function of satisfying uh, this property. On the other hand, it's of in infinite type if there are no uh, 
strictly continuous uh, positive linear functional such that phi dominates them. And uh, this decomposition of, of uh, uh, representation then at the level of states, it implies the following result and I'm explain why this is useful uh, in a moment. So the claim is that if you have an arbitrary positive linear function on, on A, then we can uniquely decompose it into a finite type of infinite type. Okay. So it's, uh, and then moreover, if uh, phi satisfies uh, KMS condition, uh, then uh, this uh, finite and infinite uh, type uh, will also uh, states uh, will also satisfy KMS condition. So uh, this way, so what it allows you to sort of uh, separately study uh, KMS state of finite type of an infinite type. And I will explain the finite type is actually very simple. And uh, uh, the, the, the goal is the, the difficult part is to understand the infinite type or prove that there are no, no such things. Okay, well, we still need uh, some preparation to get there. And so to, um, to formulate the result, uh, uh, I will need the following notation. So it's about the induced traces. So let's start with a, with a sister algebra B. I think we assume we have a right sister Hilbert B model and we have a finite positive trace store on B. Okay. Then uh, this trace defines a unique strictly over semi-continuous general infinite trace on the algebra of operators on, on your Hilbert module, such that at least uh, uh, sort of rank one compact operators is simply given by this formula. Oh, explicitly it sort of has formal similar to the usual uh, operator trace that if, if, you, if you fix an approximate unit in, in compact operators, uh, which consists of sort of these finite rank operators, uh, then um, the trace is simply limit of, sort of the obvious uh, expressions like this. Um, it will be useful, I will not use it very explicitly, but it's kind of useful to keep in mind that uh, uh, this is just part of, of, of more general statement. Uh, uh, this is what uh, Marcel uh, and I did uh, so a long time ago. And this really kind of the sister algebraic analog of uh, some results in modular theory due to Alan Kohn and Ufa Hogel. It's things like an inverse Saradonic again type theorem and spatial derivative things like this. So, so the claim is the full one that if, if we more generally uh, equip uh, this B with a time evolution, we assume that we have also sort of time evolution on our module Y, then uh, um, and we assume that Y is, is full, yeah? then in fact, there is some induction procedure for KMS weights, which would be some similar to KMS states, but uh, you allow sort of infinite values. And this way you really have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So Marita equivalence gives you a one-to-one -one correspondence between KMS weights on, on, on uh, generalized compact operators on Y. Oops, uh, of course it should not be Y, but, uh, but B, sorry. And sister algebra B. And uh, moreover, any such weight extends uniquely to a strictly wall semi continuous weight on the entire the sister algebra of operators. So, so uh, this sort of construction, this particular case of this, when, when the dynamics is trivial and one of the traces we start with is, is already finite, but in principle, it's not important. You could start with semi-finite if you got fine. Okay, um, another thing which will, just the notation, we will need uh, an obvious notation that if, you, if we do this construction and we take the trace of the identity operator, we would denote to take uh, team to Y. So, and, and this is nothing else as, as uh, for Neumann dimension of sort of a Hubert module. So more precisely, if we, if we have GNS a triple corresponding to this trace yeah, and consider corresponding finite von Neumann algebra uh, with this uh, faithful trace given by Tor, then uh, we can extend this to a Hubert module. And uh, this is then nothing else as, as the dimension of this uh, modular, von Neumann dimension of this module. Okay, sorry. And, uh, but one thing maybe to keep in mind that, okay, in general may be difficult to compute, but if, if Y is topologically generated by n elements and the dimension is, is, is just bounded by, uh, by the number of generators, which is enough for many, many purposes. Okay. 
uh, with this uh, notation, uh, the claim is that we have a complete description of, uh, of KMS states of finite time. So more precisely, they're all sort of generalized Gibbs type. So if we consider the generator of the dynamics of the on the fork module, so every element in the these elements uh, x lambda in the fork module just scaled by lambda, so very simple operator. Uh, then uh, this map, so you, you start with a trace on on on, uh, uh, on on our crystal, then you induce it you are using fork module to the entire trace on the algebra of operators on the on the fork module. Then you take this density operator and then restrict to this algebra interested. And the claim is that this way you get really a buffine bijection between positive traces on, on, on the crystal and all traces which are uh, sort of, uh, satisfy certain uh, um, normalization conditions. So the, uh, the requirement is that this sum should be equal to one. Of course, uh, you, you can have a lot of traces where this sum is simply infinite, but if you, if you get those which are finite, then you have to just properly normalize them and this way you get a Gibbs state. So um, yeah, I mean this is this is really kind of simple consequence of uh, this equivalence correspondence between KMS weights for Merita equivalent sister algebras. So, so the sort of the key point is that uh, the image of this sister algebra in our algebra of operators on the fork module is strictly dense. And as a result, if you have a KMS state which is of finite type, remember this just means that it, it, it can be extended to this. A sister algebra and as a strictly strictly continuous state, then if you restrict it to the generalized compact operators, you do get a KMS state, and then you the, the result of Marita equivalence kicks in, and uh, you can describe all KMS states here in terms of traces on AC. Okay. And uh, this this gives the result. So uh, I mean it's kind of quite. Uh, I could say it's kind of general nonsense, but it actually covers most uh, most uh, constructions one well, sees in the literature. So it's clearly all examples where people construct um, example of KMS states of sort of Gibbs type. So of course, there are particular cases of, 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 of sort of this construction. So uh, it's kind of all fine, but uh, uh, the question is, uh, but what, what about this infinite type? And, and, and the advantage of uh, sort of uh, what we gain from, from decomposing states in the finite and infinite type. Uh, because uh, if you want to classify completely, you, you, you have to understand only those of infinite type. And those are exactly those which, uh, for which there are no uh, genetic representation has no non zero vacuum vectors. And this gives you some information on, on the structure of the state. Not much, but, but a little bit. And if you manage somehow to prove that the, the uh, space of vacuum vectors is non zero, then, then, then you're done because uh, uh, and this way you conclude that there are no infinite states whatsoever. And this is what the next uh, result says. So I, I assume, uh, well, let me introduce the polar notation. So when we take a threshold state tau on, on, uh, on A0, and consider just semi-norm defined by this trace, so the usual A2 semi-norm. And then uh, the claim is as follows. So assume we can find, uh, so let me first formulate it and then I will try to explain what, uh, what the formulation means. Um, so assume that we, we can find some, some A0 submodules B lambda in this spectral subspaces right? and uh, some large beta zero such that for all betas larger than beta zero, we have the following properties that uh, uh, this sum of B lambda and new lambda is, is dense in A new for all new larger than zero in this seminal. And then the sum of uh, this is this sum is kind of very similar to what we, what we have here yeah, is, is strictly less than one. Then the claim is that uh, for all beta larger than zero, actually there are no uh, finite or infinite type KMS states. So all states will be of finite type and as a result, they are, they are completely described by the previous uh, theorem. So we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, KMS states on, on the large system and ratio states uh, on, on your crystals uh, so that define certain normalization condition. So, uh, um, so what, what, how sort of to think about one, the, the cleaner but much less useful way would be simply 
you know, simply take all possible, uh, this B lambda equal uh, A lambda for all possible lambdas. Yeah? And I could just say that, well, uh, and then uh, say that uh, this condition is satisfied. That, that would be a clean statement, but uh, uh, it would actually exclude a lot of examples. So, uh, so the, the idea is that somehow, you know, you, uh, with, with, with this, uh, some model it should be enough to detect, sort of to test whether a, ve uh, a state is, a vector is a vacuum vector or not. Yeah. So in particular, if you, you know, have this uh, a lot of products of these elements, A lambda, and different lambdas, uh, then if the, ve the first element in the product, the adjoint of the Q is a vector, then of course you don't care what happens for, for the remaining ones. Yeah. So the idea is that this B lambda should be kind of uh, chosen as, as small as possible to describe completely all sort of this creation operators as right models. Okay. So we don't have to take all possible A lambdas, you can take much smaller ones. And well, let, let me give, uh, give an example. So uh, this, uh, yeah. Uh, this actually also applies to quite many cases. And uh, in some cases, it, it, it really quickly gives you a, a complete classification of uh, uh, KMA states for large betas. So let me give one example where things work uh, particularly nicely, but uh, it, it really applies to quite many of them. Although sometimes, sometimes it can be uh, more difficult to check uh, these conditions, sometimes uh, easier. But uh, so let me give an example where, where it is particularly simple. So this is a called uh, LCM uh, monoids. Uh, this is a proper uh, has been a proper class of example the last. Uh, 10, a bit more than 10 years. Um, so, um, so briefly what, what they are. So we can, we can see the uh, left cancellative monoid and uh, such that if we take two right ideals, then, then they either do not intersect or principal ideals, sorry, then or intersect again as a principal idea. Yeah. Um, it's uh, not a very large class, but it contains a lot of interesting uh, semi-groups. So in particular, the uh, simplest cases are three and three abelian monoids. More interesting examples are this AX plus B semi groups so or rings of integers in number fields of class number one, Artin Titzman monoids, and uh, so there are a number of other examples. So um, I think it became things like this were started back in the 90s in a more restricted setting of so called quasi various ordered uh, groups, but then uh, it became more popular in the late 2000 after work of uh, Marcel Wack and Ian Rayburn, who studied X plus B semi group of the, of the just integers and found uh, some uh, in the KMS states uh, behave in sort of an interesting way there. And then it was studied by, uh, by, by uh, a number of people, in particular for this means of integers and by uh, uh, Daniel Gertrunz and then Wacker and so by, by a number of other people. So, uh, and I, I can consider certain dynamics on the sister algebra of this semi group. So, the sister algebra is by definition is the following um, it's generated by isometries, satisfying kind of this obvious rule, but then they satisfy one, one more relation, which is not obvious and goes back, goes back to Nika. So, if you, if you multiply two projections of this type, you again get a projection of the same type depending on. on, on this element R which you get here. Yeah. And because of this relation, one can quickly uh, see that uh, uh, these elements span a dense subset of your system out. So, and th this is what makes it kind of particularly nice to study because it's kind of very easy to find uh, uh, a very nice subspace, dense subspace in the system out. And we can see the uh, dynamics, which is given by the uh, some homomorphism. We just just and then scale uh, all these generators. So, so we try to understand all these uh, uh, chemistry states for large beta. And what I'm saying that the previous result would, would give it to you almost kind of effortlessly. Uh, so, first of all, uh, you we can quickly see that, um, uh, yeah, here's by the way an example where uh, uh, one sees that uh, the, the, this uh, set gamma zero. Which describes sort of the top module is much smaller than uh, just positive elements in gamma. So the group gamma here is simply an additive group generated by logarithms of the values of n. <clears throat> but uh, gamma cross is exactly the logarithms n and s. 
wireless the group of course has wireless differences which can happen to be uh, positive okay? and now i said uh, if you try to to do this um, to apply this result so I, I said the idea is that you somehow try to find the smallest possible uh, number of generators of, of uh, this creation operators as a right model okay? so and then you you simply can quite easily understand that it would be enough to take just uh, these sub models generated by all these elements in the test. And it's fine. But uh, if you think a, a bit uh, more about it, even this is too much, actually. You do, you, well, okay, I mean, this is the modulus we take, but uh, uh, how to estimate the, this, uh, how to estimate the dimensions? So here, we, we need somehow to estimate the dimension of uh, these modules for arbitrary traces, which we don't know. Yeah, we don't want to describe all traces, but we still want to estimate the uh, uh, dimension. And uh, immediate estimate is, of course, the dimension is not larger than uh, simply the number of, uh, sort of, if you fix a lambda, this is the number of elements S such that n of, n of S is equal to e to the power lambda. But if you think a little bit, it's really too much to, to do because uh, if you take elements in the kernel, right? So remember that the assumption that you need only density with respect to semi norm, with respect to trace. But with respect to if you have a trace, then this trace will be, uh, uh, we, if you take the kernel of this map, then in the genus representation, all isometries in the kernel will become simply unitaries. Okay. So, in other words, generators up to vectors of length zero, they do not change if you multiply them by elements of the kernel. And this actually leads to a much smaller set. So you define uh, uh, a equivalence duration. So we say that two elements in S is I equivalent, even only if uh, they can multiply on the right elements in the kernel. This indeed gives an equivalence duration under some assumption, which I, I, I don't want to di di dis discuss. But then the conclusion is that, in fact, the dimensions of all these lambdas are not just a number of elements here, but actually just a number of equivalence classes. And the conclusion of this is that, uh, well, you have zeta function, you can introduce zeta function of this uh, homomorphism n. And as soon as the value of zeta function in US is 2, then the states, uh, KMA states, will be completely described by threshold states on the crystal. And at this moment, you don't even know what the crystal is, but it can actually show that uh, uh, the crystal is exactly the sister algebra of the well, this has been, I said, studied uh, particular cases of this uh, by a number of people and uh, in sort of big generality, sort of trying to avoid uh, any particular cases, uh, uh, we have been doing this with, with, with Nico Stammeyer recently. And uh, of course, this uh, our, our approach was a group oil approach. And from this group oil approach, you, uh, you can say more. So in particular, you can say the same for all beta such that zeta function is finite. But here it's only for zeta function less than two. But there you really kind of have to work. You have to develop uh, this group of picture. You have to understand it to some extent that uh, this example, which of course was very brief, but I tried to convey that you know you actually you you you, you don't even have to think basically when you analyze things like this from this point. It's kind of you you are lead. You're wet uh, to, to such things by, by trying to apply this here. Um, okay, and um, yeah, I, I don't want to, I don't have time to spend uh, on various other examples, uh, but uh, say that a lot of other examples can be uh, analyzed from this point of view. But it can be, uh, first of all, a bit more difficult to check that the conditions are satisfied. Uh, and second, it can be much more non trivial to actually compute the crystal. So in particular, uh, if you look at things which uh, initiated to great extent is interesting camera states like both consistent. Again, for the both consistent, you, you would immediately conclude that uh, uh, for large betas, uh, namely for all betas where even zeta function is less than two, uh, uh, all camera states are described by uh, traces on certain sister algebra and you could quite quickly see that this sister algebra is a billion. But you would have kind of not immediately obvious what this abelian system algebra is. You would have to compute it. So let me uh, mention just one result uh, uh, which shows you how to compute it in examples which are group points. Right. Okay. So um, uh, 
Uh, let's consider the following setup. We have a locally compacted type group work. And uh, suppose we have a dynamics given by a one cycle. cycle. So in other words, just homomorphism from a group world into real numbers. Remember that we want uh, almost periodic dynamics. This means that uh, cycle should be continuous with respect to discrete topology and the real numbers. Which, of course, again, some, some restrictions, but again, most, most examples are part of this form. And then we one can introduce the, the boundary set. It appeared uh, somewhat briefly in, uh, in a already book by uh, Jean Renault, but then we studied it sort of more recently with uh, Marcel Wack and Nadia Larson. The following set, which we call boundary set. So this is a set of all points in the unit space where the, such a like cycle is, is positive on all elements of the group void with the source X. Or the same negative on elements with uh, range X. So why boundary set? This is how you kind of obtain this in, in, in practice. So if you kind of can hit an element with an element which is positive, then this is not in the boundary set. Yeah. So, so you have to go back and this sort of you backtrack, backtrack, backtrack until you, you reach the point where you cannot go or cannot go any further. So you sort of reach some boundary. And, uh, that's the explanation why it's, we call it the boundary set. And we actually showed with, uh, with Barcelo and Nadia that uh, in this picture, uh, this group corresponding reduced group OSC were already describes the ground states. And of course, then most natural to assume that this is the same sister algebra as we defined here. And it, it is indeed the case. So we claim that if you have a locally compact, uh, not necessarily even house dwarf with that group word, and you have, sorry, a cycle omega with boundary set n, then the uh, crystal of this sister algebra is exactly the reduced sister algebra, sorry, the sister algebra of the reduced group point by this uh, boundary set. So in particular, it will be uh, the crystal is not zero if and only if the boundary set is not zero. And, and this allows you to compute it in, in practice sort of quite quickly because uh, this is the models when very often uh, has to develop to analyze the structure of the theory. So particularly in both consistent various X plus B semi-groups and so on, where you can quickly find this uh, these crystals this way. Okay. Yeah, so that was all about uh, uh, chemistry, but let me say a few words about uh, uh, K-theory. And, um, and here, if one looks at sort of some of this theory and uh, some of the things I kind of promoted that one should think of, uh, first of all, as a chocolate uh, algebra, right? So as, as, an, as our main example. And if one takes this sort of thing seriously, then we know that for chocolate algebra, it's KKQ and the complex numbers. So you, if you are very optimistic, then you think, okay, well, maybe this algebra in general has chocolates like structure. And then maybe we can construct KK class in, 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 uh, from AC into A. Of course, we cannot expect this to be kind of always a isomorphism, but maybe there is at least some canonical choice of this. And in some good cases, under some additional assumption, maybe we can uh, even say that it's KK theory. One can also approach it from this point of view uh, of, uh, of freezing. So the idea is that after all, we obtain this crystal AC, but in some way freezing A. And if you think of, if you think of this as a sort of continuous process, you, know, you can say that, well, uh, uh, maybe this continuous process gives you maybe asymptotic asymptotic morphism from A to AC. And uh, again, uh, hmm? I, I guess you, you need to use Morita equivalence to have something. Uh... I mean, well, uh, yeah, something of this sort, but maybe Marita equivalence, maybe, but okay. Well, let's, let's, I mean, yeah, okay. So, well, okay. I, I should say that uh, we haven't succeeded in, in any of these dreams. And uh, of course, it's always more difficult to explain why we don't succeed than, than succeed. But uh, I will uh, want to explain that there are some, 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 some reasons to kind of be a little bit doubtful that it should work in great generality and so nicely. Okay. So the reality is that uh, well, I promoted this chocolate algebra, but of course you have many more examples. And the simplest example uh, which you can take apart is actually not even chocolate algebra, but just the compact operators inside the, the chocolate algebra. Okay. And then we see the problems with uh, with functionality because uh, the embedding, the embedding map, so the construction of a crystal is, is canonical and uh, is functorial. 
and uh, corresponding map on, on crystal just for identity map on complex numbers. On the other hand, we all know that k, k class of this embedding is zero. Yeah? So this, this shows you that you, you probably cannot hope for something very canonical. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, at least it would be a bit natural or strange if it was canonical, but at the same time, non-factorial. It doesn't work this way usually. And, uh, but this is just one example. There are, there are many, many other examples of, uh, uh, of similar problems. In fact, the, the first problem of this type you see even in finite dimensions. So more precisely, again, consider algebra of canonical commutation and canonical anti-commutation relations. So when I take just a finite dimensional Hilbert space, co-dimension one subspace, so we have that then embedding. And again, the crystals are just complex numbers and the embedding induces an isomorphism of crystals. On the other hand, if you look at the uh, embedding map at the level of K theory, then it is multiplication by two, yeah, or minus two depending on how we identify this. Okay. So again, you, we, we see some issues with factoriality here. And by the way, I, I will have to use it briefly later. I notice that uh, if you take infinite dimensional, then the crystal is still, still complex numbers as I already gave an example. So the complex numbers, uh, K theory is uh, K0 and Z, but uh, uh, K0 of the car algebra is uh, a group uh, of uh, Z, well, it's a limit of one to one to Z. Okay, so we have problems here, but uh, the problems do not stop even here. So uh, well, let me just concentrate on, on the simplest example, like uh, the nicest example possible. So I just, as I said, that we basically want to see uh, uh, these things, uh, look at these things as chocolates like algebras in general. And we know so for this, if the chocolates algebras, these things work very nicely. So let's just look at the pips of chocolates algebras. So in other words, um, I, I take a sister algebra D and I take a full sister correspondence over D and consider this usual chocolates, uh, uh, chocolate spins of sister algebra of uh, this creation operators from the Spock module with the gauge action. And then you again quickly see that, that uh, your crystal is the algebra D as it should be. Nice. F is uh, this our Fock module is the standard Fock module okay, as it should be. And then we know that in this case, of course, the embedding map of the coefficient algebra in the, uh, the uh, Pibsdorf chocolates algebra uh, uh, is a KK equivalence by a result of Pibsdorf. Okay. So uh, it's all nice, but then uh, we can uh, ask, okay, but what about functoriality? And you, you can ask this question here without K theory. So uh, you can ask, well, can I actually reconstruct the entire our sister algebra and this correspondence from, from, from this picture? Okay. So we will already see that uh, if we just look at this as an abstract sister algebra, this pins uh, the chocolate algebra, uh, and uh, this gauge dynamics, we can reconstruct of this uh, from this pair uh, the algebra D, this is, this is the crystal, and we can reconstruct Y as a, as a right sister Hilbert module. We can also reconstruct the entire folk module as, as a module of Y and on the other hand of a chocolate out. But the question is, can we reconstruct the left action of D on Y? Okay. If we could, then at least uh, this way we would know that, well, functorality would work fine this way. And it turns out that the answer is no. So there is a, a, a recent uh, example by Brown of uh, Walker, Robertson, and Sims. Uh, they consider graph sister algebras. So the, the simplest example of this, or nicest maybe example of this uh, setup. So you can see the two graphs, um, G and B, that have the same number of vertices, so six vertices, and they have uh, almost the same edges, but they differ in, in, in just one uh, edge, in two edges. So the, the green graph has edge going from V1 to V2, but no edge from V1 to V3, and blue graph has edge going from V1 to V3, but no, uh, extra edge from the one to the two. Okay. And then we can see the corresponding uh, with chocolate spins their algebras. So in other words, uh, here the uh, algebra D is just uh, C, C6. So it's an algebra of continuous functions on vertices and Y is uh, the functions on, on edges and multiplication is given by recurrence and source map. And the details are not so, so important. And they show that 
For these two uh, graphs, which are obviously different, and so the modules are different, uh, the corresponding uh, pairs of triplets in the algebra are isomorphic. And moreover, so I don't write the formulas, but if you just uh, look at the formulas and check, you, you will see them that the isomorphism they construct of these algebras equivalent. It's an identity map on the crystals, but at the level of KFE, so we could identify this KFE with uh, KFE of the coefficient algebra. So we get a map on, from Z6 into Z6. It's actually not, not, not the identity map. It's, uh, it's given by this matrix. And this sort of, you, you can even see why, why this one minus one appears. It's like you erase, erase one of the edges and you add one of the more edges to, <coughs> to the graph. Okay, so, so it's equivalent in the sense of a gauge action. Yes, yes, equivalent respect to the gauge action. Yeah. So, uh, so we see that well, these dreams are kind of not easy to realize. So that's something, something going on which makes it uh, probably difficult to make something very canonical. But at the same time, in all these examples, it somehow works, right? We still have the same K theory. Apart from the, this example uh, yeah, here, that uh, it's a little bit different, but also not that much, maybe different. Uh, okay, it's a different group than Z, but at least it's still of rank one. Right? So the conclusion you might draw from this is that first, maybe we should not hope too much for some uh, functional reality. And second, uh, well, maybe we have to rationalize. So if we pass to rational K-theory, at least we'll get uh, the same K-theory for in, in this example. So let's, let's try to do it. Um, and we'll do the simplest possible case because we, even this case, we don't kind of really understand. So uh, let's try to make it as simple as possible, but still to, to have some non-trivial examples. Right? So this, this setup will at least cover all the stoplets uh, Pibsner triplets algebras and uh, their subalgebras of compact operators, things like this. Okay, so we'll, we'll deal only with the circle action. And uh, we'll, in addition, uh, make two, two simplifications. We assume that the, so, uh, the entire sister algebra is generated by just a, a spectral spaces A0 and A1. Uh, this is what is called sometimes a semi saturated action. And then we assume that this idea of I minus 1 is actually the entire set A0. Is what I mean that, but I1 can be, of course, not true. And uh, so uh, this assumption implies that this, you have a sequence of ideals which is decreasing, and then uh, our ideal, which is used to define the crystal, is simply the ideal I1, and the crystal is simply the quotient of a zero by I1. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I said, this, this in particular uh, covers uh, this. Uh, their triplets algebras and uh, they are subalgebras of compact operators. Okay, so to formulate the result, let me introduce the following notation, basically for Paul and uh, So we can view because because of this assumption, of sort of uh, fullness, uh, we can view. Oops, uh, uh, yeah, it's a mistake. Should be a minus one. Should, uh, a minus one should uh, we can view as a, even as part of a, a, a modular with, with zero odd part. So uh, let me denote this, uh, this class. Uh, yeah, I don't know what is written here, but uh, uh, <laughs> this class defines an endomorphism of the NK theory, yeah? and we denote it by beta. And this way, uh, the K groups of A0 becomes uh, a ZT module. So in other words, this T is the action by uh, this element in the, the discus part of module. Okay? So then the claim is the following. So assume that the following conditions are satisfied. So assume is that if we rationalize the K, uh, K groups, then uh, the QT module, which we get this way, is finitely generated. Okay. And assume that the, uh, the action of T on, on, uh, on this uh, rational, uh, rational K theory is, uh, has neither uh, zeros nor non zero fixed points. Okay. Then the claim that uh, K theory will be isomorphic to, uh, to K theory of the crystal. And if you, in addition, have a free module, then, then uh, you have an isomorphism here. And uh, yeah, again, uh, this at least covers kind of more or less the case of two triplet spins, the algebras, and compact operators. So it's kind of not empty. But let me say a 
just a few general words how reasonable and reasonable are these assumptions. Okay. Well, the assumption one is finite generation. I mean, it's a bit unclear what it means, but I don't think it's kind of too bad in a way because like even if we want to consider say k match states, we need some finiteness assumption, right? So that we assume that things do not grow too, too, too fast and things like this. So this is an assumption of this sort, which is I think acceptable, but these assumptions are a bit more kind of not clear what they mean. Uh, so let me say a few words about them and I will finish. So first of all, uh, yeah, not, but not difficult to see that uh, uh, the, the action of T on, on this rational K theory is has zero kernel if and only if the invariant map from this idea of I1 and K0 is rationally objective. Of course, this doesn't happen too often, but uh, uh, always, but it does happen exactly often uh, because uh, if K1 as a module is finitely generated, then this is the case. So again, this is some sort of finite generation assumption, which is which is satisfied in many examples. So it's, it's a rather a rather mild assumption. So it's a bit less clear what uh, uh, what this assumption means that T has no fixed points. Oops. Uh, and uh, if you try to analyze it, uh, the claim is the following: that uh, instead of analyzing all uh, fixed points, we will take the intersection of all uh, modules when you multiply uh, added by powers of T. So in particular, the intersection will contain all points fixed by T. So if it is zero, then the assumption is satisfied. But then one can check that this intersection is nothing else as uh, that you look at the image of K theory of this ideal spy N and then intersect of this, uh, these images. Okay, so uh, when, it, uh, when is this intersection is zero? But the claim is that uh, this homomorphism or representation of an algebra on the fog module is faithful if and only if the intersection of an ideal is zero. So, so this assumption is something you probably want to include because if, if it is not satisfied, this means your sort of folk module does not even remember the entire sister algebra, right? The crystal does not remember a part of sister algebra. There is no way you, you can hope to get the K theory of your original sister algebra. So this is kind of a very reasonable assumption. Of course, this assumption does not imply this, uh, that this intersection is zero, but again, uh, I mean, you can of course construct examples where uh, this is zero, but this is not zero, but uh, it actually has to struggle a bit. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're not going to come for free. So in reasonable examples, the intersection of idea zero would imply that uh, the intersection of images of uh, in the K group will be zero as well. So in the end, uh, yeah, one question is how useful it is. I don't know, but at least the assumption do not seem very unreasonable. And uh, at least they cover um, some examples. Um, and the proof, well, let me just do a slide. The proof is not, it's not kind of difficult of this. It's, uh, it's often the case with circle action is based on two six term sequences. So you have very similar sequences uh, computed um, uh, on the one hand, uh, K, K, uh, yeah, I mean, basically K, K, uh, K groups of uh, crystal, on the other hand, uh, K groups of your uh, original uh, sister, sister algebra A. Okay. And uh, one is, is just usual six, six term exact sequence coming from short exact sequence uh, of sister algebras. The other one is sort of this Pimsner Vekulescu type sequence, very similar to Pimsner six term sequence in, in his paper on Queen's Pimsner algebras. So, and, uh, so you compare these two sequences, use uh, the assumptions and conclude that, uh, the result. So kind of the result is, it's not empty, it covers uh, uh, some examples, but of course it is uh, not really satisfactory. You kind of don't get uh, much wiser by, by seeing the proof of uh, what's going on, but at least I hope it's, uh, it's clear that something interesting is going on with K-theory, but uh, how exactly to understand it, I think it remains to be seen. So that's all. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any additional questions? Yes, uh, there is one question, uh, Sergei, which I, which I want to know. In, in your framework, uh, can you get some handle on the limit cases where you, you will have, um, you know, um, finite uh, states that for beta 
getting lower will sort of converge in a certain sense to infinite states. And then, you know, one would like to know the type of the factor corresponding to the infinite state, which is a limit. Uh, you, you know what I have in mind. I mean, you know, like, yeah. Well, I, I think you kind of mean, in generality, it's probably not so realistic. At least I don't know of any, any idea. Like, uh, even, you know, this, uh, for example, in, in this result, uh, of course, the, this, this assumption looks very strange. I mean, one would, yeah. would expect that already finiteness of this sum should imply that, that uh, all states are, are for finite pipe, but mm -hmm. actually don't know whether this is the case. Uh -huh, I see. So, so, you, so you didn't quite reach the boundary because of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so but I said in this kind of big generality, I think one, um, one can hardly expect that uh, one see this fine properties because of course, uh, this is a piece boundary where finite, you see this finite, finite steps, but at some point, you have this. Uh, uh, it's infinite. Yeah, yeah, phase transition, and you have you see the appearance of infinite states. I mean, right. This is where the fine analysis is, and uh, this yeah. probably cannot be approached from very general point of view. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Anyone else? So if not, then uh, well, thanks again, Sergey. And um, but we will see each other next week again. Yes. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye.